So culturally responsive practice in social studies is what we're going to spend our time today talking about. Um, I am Shanti Ellen Govin, CEO and founder. For those of you who weren't at the keynote this morning, I'm the CEO and founder of Inquire Ed. I'm a former elementary school teacher. Um, I taught K2 and then I taught fifth and sixth grade. Then I was an instructional coach um, and then I was a curriculum director. So I, and I started Inquire Ed about almost four years ago now. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me and I'll jump in from there, tell you a little bit about this. I think everybody knows this if you've been to other sessions, kind of the norms, just to repeat, large group. I love how most people have their cameras on. Thank you for that. Totally up to you and what that looks like. Use that chat, please, as much as you'd like to. Um, and then in breakouts, we'd love for you to engage. Totally understand if you can't always have your camera on in breakouts, but love for you to engage with each other as much as possible because this is the Inquiry Institute and we can't do it by just lecturing at you all um, all day long. So we got to live uh, what, we, what we're saying here. Um, oh, I'm not screen sharing. Thank you. I thought it was screen sharing. Appreciate the heads up. There we go. All right. So we're going to start today um, with just a baseline definition. Um, and we're going to use this definition. We're going to talk more and a, a lot more about what culture responsive education means. But I'd love to have you all read this definition. And then in a second, I'm going to ask you about kind of your entry point. I'd love to use this definition from Zaretta Hammond um, as kind of our ground point for where your entry point is into culture responsive education. And it'll just help me as a facilitator think about kind of how I'm approaching this as we're going through this. So CRE is the process of using familiar cultural information and processes to scaffold learning. It emphasizes communal orientation and focuses on relationships, cognitive scaffolding, and critical social awareness. Um, so I uh, love for you all to just, in, in a second, chat based on that definition. I am new to the idea of culture responsive education, so that's going to be a one. Two, I'm familiar with CRE, but haven't implemented much as a teacher or leader. Three, I have some experiments implementing CRE in my classroom or school. Or four, I feel very comfortable implementing CRE in my classroom or school. Um, and so one, two, three, four, one lead being totally new and four pretty being pretty comfortable. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the definition so you can be thinking about that as you chat. So please just throw that in the chat to everyone. Thank you. So a couple of threes, some twos, fours. So we've got kind of some ones, twos, it's got kind of a, a mixed group, it seems like. All right, so I'll kind of try to do a little bit of everything. Um, so to kind of uh, think about the different folks of where different folks are. Um, I wanted to say too, I saw Melissa mention, I haven't seen an example of an, a lower level lesson plan. Actually in um, today's uh, session, we're actually gonna be looking at some example lesson plans. So to give you an opportunity to look at what inquiry really looks like, at, especially at the lower grade levels, but you'll be able to choose what grade level you'd like to look at. So just wanted to respond to that in the chat. Um, all right, so let's jump in. So today's session, we're gonna just start with high level, what is CRE? Um, hopefully, that is, gives you kind of the baseline. And I'm sure for some of you that are threes and fours, some of this will be repetitive, but gives us all an opportunity to kind of get on the same page. Um, well, two, then we're gonna talk about instructional practices role, really where curriculum and instructional design comes into play. And then we're gonna look at some actual lesson plans and really talk about CRE and practice and kind of dissect what we're seeing and, what, where, and how we see it happen in practice. Um, so what is CRE? Um, so, you know, a lot of different terms are out there. Culturally sustaining pedagogy, culturally relevant practice, culturally compatible methods, lots and lots and lots and lots of terms here. Um, and so for today, we're going to be using the culturally relevant education term, CRE. Um, the thing I will say about this is there is some nuances of differences between these things. I don't want to say that they're all the same, but there is an umbrella here that we're talking about, and we're really going to be using the words culture responsive education. And sometimes you can replace the kind of, you know, not all the way, but replace these words with some of the other terminology here that you see. Um, so that's just kind of a note on words. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I quoted Zaretta Hammond earlier, we lean very heavily on Zaretta Hammond's work here at Inquire Ed. Um, and she has a framework called the dimensions of equity. And in this framework, she talks about kind of the difference between multicultural education, social justice education, and culturally responsive pedagogy. 
And so we're really going to be focused on this right side of things. But I think it's a good opportunity to just think about, you know, sometimes people get really focused, especially in the past, on kind of multicultural education, right? So celebrating diversity, opportunities for just thinking about social interactions across differences, things like that. Then I think the conversation started to move a little bit more towards social justice education and really raising students' consciousness about inequity. But in culturally responsive pedagogy, we're really pushing things forward. And we're really thinking about focusing on improving the learning capacity of diverse students who've been marginalized educationally, centering around the effective and cognitive aspects of teaching and learning. So really what works in the brain for all students, right? So culturally responsive education is something that is research-based. It's not just something that somebody's coming up with and saying, oh, this is good for students. It's good for students that have been historically marginalized or good for students that have not been. It's good for all students in terms of really building on their cognitive uh, aspects. And it concerns itself with building resilience and an academic mindset by pushing back on dominant narrative, narratives about people of color. So this framework, as I said, is kind of like the groundwork for how we approach this work. Uh, and so kind of using what were the three column he headings back one slide? Sorry about that. Multicultural education, social justice education, and culture responsive pedagogy. And I think these slides will be posted in a few days. So feel also you'll be, have a chance to grab that as well then. Um, so those are those three. So let's go a little further in breaking that down because that's a lot of words, honestly. I love her framework, but I think sometimes it can be like, okay, what does that mean exactly? Cognitive, this, that, lots and lots of words. So this is kind of our breakdown at Inquire Ed of what we talk about when we talk about instructional practices role in CRE. And I absolutely love this quote for, from Dr. Goldie Muhammad. She says, I've never met an unmotivated child in my years working with youth. I have, however, met unmotivating curriculum and instruction. And I think we can all agree that we've seen unmotivating curriculum and instruction. And so I think it's really important to ground what we're doing in that idea of really thinking about how are we thinking about the instructional design of experiences for students. I saw a lot of chats about really thinking about how does this work at K2? This is this is really challenging, right? It's hard when your students are, aren't, you think of inquiry as like they have to be independently learning, reading, things like that. That's not the case. And I think when you see our, our, our you know, K2 lessons, if you browse through, you see that it doesn't need to look like that. There are multiple ways for, to design learning experiences in a way that they are motivating for all students and that we really are grounding it in who they are and their lived experience. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna be diving into more. So when I think about culturally responsive education and really breaking it down, kind of past the big terms, I think of kind of four different categories, authentic content, kind of what the content is, what's actually written in the content, instructional strategies. So that's really kind of the pedagogy. How is that content packaged? What's the learning experiences that students are going through to unpack that content? Relationships with students, that's very key, right? So I can't, a curriculum can't do it all. The relationship that individual teachers have with students and how they relate to students and the space that they set up for students to be able to have those relationships is a key component of this. And then personal reflection, really thinking your own identity work. Who are you as an individual and what are you bringing? What biases might you be bringing to the classroom? What uh, um, ex, you know, conclusions might you bringing? I talked about this a little bit in the keynote. What's the things that you're bringing to the classroom that is you, that, that personal reflection piece? The well, piece about well-designed instruction, it can be a huge part of this, but I, I wanna say it can't be the whole thing that when we're talking about curricular experiences, we're talking about the authentic content and the instructional strategies pieces. And that there's a huge component of this, relationships with students' personal reflection that I'm not gonna really spend time on because that is an entirely different PD to really think about self-identity and how that might be happening, affecting what's happening in the classroom and then really thinking about how you're building those relationships with students. So I, it's a little bit of a cop-out, but I really wanna acknowledge that those two things are huge key components of culture responsibility of education and we're not really hitting on those two components today and that we're really going to focus on these first two categories of authentic content and instructional strategies really in thinking about kind of the practical side of what's happening in the crap classroom and how you're designing learning experiences that support culturally responsive education so let's first think about authentic content um, so when i think about authentic content i think about it in these three categories 
So I think first about content connecting to students' lived experiences. So what does that mean, connect to students' lived experiences? So students' lived experiences is what it's exactly what it sounds like, right? It's what they're living out every day. And in social studies, this can be hard, right? Because in social studies, we're often so focused on historical experiences. And we're talking about things that have happened in the past and it can be boring for students. It can be removed from what they have experienced in their lives and feel completely different. And so it's really thinking about how do we connect to the students lived and historical experiences. So that student's demographics, what are their historical experiences of, their, of that individual students of, of their heritage? And then what's the lived experience of them? And really thinking about how do we connect content to a modern day context so they can make those connections. So if you think about the, that's the cognitive side of it, right? If I'm not drawing connections for students about how this relates to the day to day, it's gone, right? I memorize it for a test and then tomorrow it's out of my head because it didn't connect to anything practical for me. But once I really start to think about a modern day experience, the students lived experience and I'm able to make those connections. Like I was talking about today in the keynote, like the American revolution can feel pretty removed. But when I think about what taxation without representation today in students lived experiences, when I think about what's happening and where people might be trying to think about revolution in the times that we're living in today and pushing against certain ideas and pushing against governments, those are all things that we all live with every day that is totally a part of our lives. And so how do we put, how do we bring this ideas to modern day context? Second piece that I think about in terms of authentic content is decolonized curricular content. So I'm guessing not surprising to most of you on this call, especially those that rank themselves as three and fours, is that the traditional textbook model, um, and I could rant all day about the traditional textbook model, has really taken a colonizer's approach to curricular content. It's taken a very Western European view and everything is from that view. That's the central point from where we, where uh, uh, the perspective in which content is presented. And so in authentic content that supports culture responsive education, we're really trying to break that down and think about a decolonized lens. So what are we thinking about? So when we think about the 13 colonies, for example, are we only thinking about the experience of the people that were the colonizers? Or are we thinking about the different people, the different groups that were affected by what that happened? What were the ramifications for different people? How, what were the starting points from that? How was the, uh, the uh, African slave trade part of that? What was going on in all these pieces of this? So in the enslaved people, so all of these pieces coming into it is when we're thinking about that decolonized content and not just coming at it from this very colonized uh, European perspective. It's so also thinking about just like where do we represent content and this is hard with standards because so much of the standards is is has to do with western history. And so this is challenging, but we can often bring in opportunities when we're talking about ancient cultures and things like that to not just represent the, you know, standard few that we always talk about and really talk about others that have been historically not talked about in the standard curricular content. When I think about authentic content, I also think about diverse sources and unheard voices. So this is something that is, I will say, very near and dear to my heart is this idea of diverse sources and unheard voices. So when you think about the traditional textbook model, what you think about is a tome of knowledge, right? You've got one textbook provider. They might provide some images of primary sources and things like that. But at the end of the day, there is one textbook publisher that is doing all of the secondary sourcing of that thing. So they're drawing the conclusions. They're doing all of the narrative around those sources. And so whether a publisher says or not that they are being having diverse sources there, it's very challenging when you're doing all of the writing about what happened to actually have diverse perspectives brought in. This is challenging from multiple ways from a culturally responsive piece in terms of thinking about having an understanding of mirrors and windows, windows for students, getting sources from different places. It's also problematic from accuracy. So when we're talking about students drawing their own conclusions, we've got to think about, are we drawing, a textbook draws a conclusion for them. In an inquiry-based model, we want students to be looking at multiple sources from this person, from this person, from this person, and then thinking about how do I triangulate these together and then draw my own conclusions based on the evidence in front of me. We also really think about unheard voices. 
So oftentimes when we see indigenous people represented in a textbook or traditional curriculum, we're only hearing from white people. We're hearing from white people that are talking about the experience of indigenous people. It's incredibly important that we mix in, that we're representing the voices of the people that we are talking about. And so we're really bringing in videos, different sources, primary sources, multiple things that are actually from the groups that we are studying, that we're having students study. And so unheard voices really needs to be a key component of that. I will say to you that a standard textbook can't do this. It really can't. You've got to be able to have sources across multiple places in order to integrate diverse sources and unheard voices. It's a real media literacy opportunity as well, because it would really provide the opportunity for students to understand, okay, who's the publisher? Who's the author? What, is the, what baggage are they bringing? What perspective, what bias? And I think there's a session on source selection and, and that'll be a real opportunity to dive more deeply into that piece about diverse sources and unheard voices. All right, so um, I promise I'm gonna stop talking in a minute and give you guys all an opportunity to do um, some, uh, some talking on a board. Um, so we're now going to talk about instructional strategies. Um, and again, we're leaning heavily on Zaretta Hammond's work here. Um, so instructional strategies are all about the learning experiences. So what I just talked about in authentic content, this is kind of the stuff that I think most people think about when they think about CRE. They think about these things. They think about decolonized curricular content. They think about what are the sources that are using? What's the content? But I think they sometimes forget that it's also about how the learning experience is designed that this is really in thinking about all of the cognitive pieces of how the brain, you know, uh, Zaretta Hammond's book is called College Responsive Teaching and the brain, again, really leaning on brain science to really think about what works for students. And these learning instructional strategies are really designed to build on that cognitive research. So lesson structure, real world problems, talk to learn, long-term projects, cognitive routines, non-linguistic representations, stories, metaphors, and analogies, and collective learning. So rather than me breaking down each one of these, I want to do what I uh, an inquiry based activity that I love, which is a jigsaw. Um, so you all are going to have the opportunity to read a bit about each one of these, um, and then you can choose two, one or two, or maybe even three, depending on how much time and how fast you work um, to really report out on on a, a jam board. So in a minute. Um, or in a second, Ashley is going to help us out and she is going to chat two links. So you're going to chat one link to a document um, that is actually talking about our um, inquiry journeys curriculum. And I tried very hard to find a document that talks about these strategies that doesn't come from us, but I couldn't find one that was less than a page. Um, so I so ignore pages one and three. Um, you can read that on your own if you'd like to. But really, you're focusing on page two about this right side of the document, um, really thinking about the instructional strategies and this document breaks it down. So she's going to send you the link for this, and you're going to pick one, two to three instructional strategies and read about those instructional strategies. You can read more, but I'd like you, in, after about three minutes, to switch over to the Jamboard. And we've got, I heard there were some Jamboard problems, so we uh, made some, some changes here, some adjustments. And we've got two different Jamboards for you. We've got one that is last name starts with A to M, and then one that is last name starts with N to Z. So depending on your last name, what your last name starts with, you're going to go to one of these Jamboards. And on the Jamboard, you're going to see multiple boards. And each one of these is for a different instructional strategy. So you're going to pick the two to three that you decided. If you only get to two, that's totally fine. If you only get to one, that's totally fine. Go as deep as you'd like on one. And you're going to record some observations. You're going to grab a Post-it. I just grab it and drag it down and then double click on it to write in it. And you're going to record some observations. You're going to record what resonates for you, and then you're also going to record what you foresee as challenges or what you've already experienced as challenges in terms of thinking about that particular instructional strategy in the classroom. So you'll see all eight of the instructional strategies on here, um, real world problems, talk to learn, long term projects. So just scroll through and do the two or three that you've decided to do a deep dive on. Before I go, I'm going to give you 10 minutes for this, and then we'll come back and take a look at what people have done um, really specifically, especially on the implementation challenges, um, and talk a bit about that. And But I want to take a moment first to just see if there's any questions. 
Yes, as Ashley said, please do not open both because that will cause our limit to be reached. So we can only have 50 people in each jam board. So if you go to um, eight, the one that is not for you, then we will might hit a, an issue. Any questions before I go? We go? No? All good to go? Awesome. I'm going to set a timer and uh, put myself on mute. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. You want to take a second, just wrap up um, your thought there, and we will take a look at what you all have done here. Um, so I'm just going to do some bopping around between the boards since we have two different boards. Um, so it looks like this one, no one put anything in lesson structure. We'll come over here to this one. Um, I do want to acknowledge someone said this sounds like a commercial for inquiry journeys materials. I apologize if that document felt that way. Like I said, I had some trouble finding a succinct document um, that really described each of the practices that wasn't a multi-page document. And so apologies for that if it felt that way. Um, please don't take it that way. I think these instructional strategies go across any uh, space that we want you to be really supporting students. Um, so really thinking about observations, a couple of things I'm noticing here, thinking about being helpful for uh, emergent readers or EL students. Um, these strategies could easily be used in other content areas. Um, jumping to what resonates, um, thinking about multiple strategies and routines that teachers can use to help students be successful. Coming over to challenges, not necessarily a challenge with your materials or these ideas, just the general time of learning for SS. Yes, totally agree. And when you think about lesson structure, you're really thinking about that opening, active inquiry and closing and that idea of these multiple components of the lesson. And it can be really challenging to think about timing if you have really limited time. I, I totally hear you. And I think that that's something that we really need to be pushing our administrators on and saying we social studies matters. It matters for social studies. It matters for it, literacy. It matters because we our students need to be engaged uh, citizenry. Um, I have some issues with the word citizen. So that idea of engaged, informed people in this world. And so social studies matters. And we've got to really advocate for that as educators. Um, I also think there are creative ways to think about how this goes across learning, uh, across subject areas. And other a couple other people mentioned this. When you think about lesson structure, that lesson structure applies to all subject areas. It's not just about thinking about how how this applies to social studies, that that lesson structure is something you can be doing across subject areas and also is an opportunity to bring social studies into some ELA time. Um, the major challenge is using full-on digital information to guide an inquiry. Our school is not at all one-to-one -one technology. I got to say, I really don't expect that you need one-to-one -one technology to be able to do inquiry. So when I talk about varied sources, um, what I'm talking about is you might be going and getting those sources and printing them from multiple places, or you might use a curriculum like us that points you to those sources or whatever that is. But the expectation is not that students are just off on the web going on their own. I think that that's actually a, kind of a, 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 a myth about inquiries, this idea that students are just off and you're just sending them onto the internet and they're going into Google and going to town. Just like anything, we want to scaffold these things for our, our students. We want to be able to ensure that they have an opportunity to interact with sources. And that could be on a website if you have the opportunity for multiple students around one thing. That might be on your uh, on your um, board in your, in your room and you're all looking at one thing on at the same time. Or you might have printed something and your students are annotating that and thinking about who the author is and where this came from and those kinds of things. So there's lots of different ways for students to interact with different sources that don't require one-to-one -one technology. Um, let's jump to real world problems. Um, so uh, talking about kind of relevant and empowering students, real world equals meaningful and deep connections. Jumping to some of the challenges, and I got to tell you, real world problems, I, I understand it, it, it's, a, it's one that's challenging to think about when we think about real world problems, especially when we're talking about things that are, when we talked about this earlier, is what is, you were talking about history, and then how do I bring that to a real world problem that my students have? Um, so some of the challenges that you all identified, needing more time to plan units and experiences. It can be challenging to organize interviews and field trips. I wanna say to you that I think at a baseline, it doesn't necessarily need to be real world problems, doesn't need to be outside the classroom that start small, that maybe as you get more accustomed to an inquiry-based model, you can start bringing interviews in, you can bring field trips in. The second time you do that same unit, you're bringing more and more into it as you have that more kind of grasp of it. 
But real world problems, I'll tell you, my, I have a third, almost fourth grader and almost first grader, and they, if you ask them problems well, about what's around them, they're going to bring up lots and lots of things. Uh, and so I think thinking about how that can be spaced in the classroom is important. Now, going beyond that into the community is great, and I want you to be pushing towards that, but I don't think you need to feel like that's the primary starting point for the work. Um, I finding authentic rather than contrived informed action for students to engage with. I, I couldn't agree with this point more. Oftentimes we've got this kind of write a letter to your mayor, but it's not actually going to the mayor. And I think the challenge is there is like, maybe they didn't need to write to the mayor. Maybe it's fine. Maybe they need to think about who their community members are that they can actually reach. Maybe that community member is their principal. Maybe that community member is the second grade classroom and you're the fourth grade classroom. The informed action is not about necessarily needing the glitzy project of going out into the community and being with, you know, talking to the mayor. That's great if that's what happens in your classroom, but it can also be very hyper localized to your school and really think about what's authentic. What's authentic for students is the understanding of what they have and they understand their school. They understand their peers in their building. And so thinking about authentic informed action right where they are, it can be a real way to make it authentic and not make it so gigantic that you can't get started. Um, I'm gonna go through just two more of these um, so we make sure that we don't lose our time here. Um, teaching students about academic discourse in terms of talking to learn. Um, so talking to learn is this idea of that we're not just always going through the written word and that we're having opportunities for students to talk to learn. And so. This idea of what resonates, students must hear, then think, then say before they can write or do. Talking to learn is such a critical piece of building schools and content knowledge that we've got to be able to think through things that as humans, this is goes again across brain research, that we can't just be asked to be to just regurgitate something from something and just put it on a test. Um, I want to get to some of the questions that are in the um, chat and I'm noticing my time and knowing that I'm talking for a while. So if we have time, we're going to come back to a few more of these at the end, but I'm going to jump back to our deck um, and go through. Um, some of the questions that are in the chat, um, question, how can you fit your ELA standards if you have them into your social studies content standards? Um, I think you'll see when we look at some example lessons. Um, you'll see that well, we, you can click on a standards button and you'll see in a second kind of how the, you, the uh, ELA standards are tracking with that uh, social studies one. And I think that might give you some answers to that. These other questions I'll come back to um, if we have time at the end. So it's curriculum, culturally responsive education and practice. So now we're going to go into some breakout rooms for about uh, 12 minutes. Um, what you're going to do is have the opportunity to look at some lessons. And I want to really say, I want to acknowledge that point that somebody made. The idea is not to sell you on these lesson plans. The idea is really for you to see an example of what it looks like. And this is what we do at Inquire Ed. We develop learning experiences. And so it's the best way for you to, for us to show you how a learning experience can be designed with these instructional practices embedded in them. And so you're going to get a chance to select a lesson plan that is appropriate for wherever your experience is, depending on grade level, whatever lesson plan you want to choose. Um, and you can choose um, any of the lesson plans, regardless of your group. So you're, some people in your group might have chosen a kindergarten lesson. Some people in your group might choose a fifth grade lesson. It's OK. So what you're going to do is you're going to choose the lesson that you want. And then you're just going to you can read through about the unit and about the lesson. And then you're going to click the go to lesson button. And then that's going to open up the lesson. And for those of you who want to look, you can look at the standards that are right there that are connected to this lesson. Um, and you're going to uh, browse through this lesson. As you're looking through this lesson, what you're going to be doing is this first section of the Jamboard. So you're going to really think about how does the lesson present authentic content and what CRE instructional strategies do you see in the lesson? If you are somebody that likes to write, grab a post-it and put that right there. If you don't and you just want to be prepared for the conversation, don't feel free to just have that in your head or write notes in your notebook. You don't need to put it on the jam board. It's really up to you. Um, so as you're independently going through it for five minutes, you're thinking about how does the lesson present authentic content and what CRE instructional strategies do you see in the lesson that we just talked about? In step two, you're going to talk as a group for seven minutes and respond to the following prompts. And this is where I'd love for you to actually incorporate some ideas onto the Jamboard. How do the lesson support CRE? Oh, and sorry, let me say this. Select the person with the longest first name to be the reporter, just to make it easy for everyone. Unless somebody's dying to be the reporter in the room, I know it can be awkward when you go into a breakout room and who's gonna do what. Just if you have the person with the longest first name jump in, that would be great. Respond to the following prompts as a group. 
How do the lessons support culturally responsive education? And then acknowledging that a lesson can only go so far, how could you imagine going further and supporting CRE in these lessons? Um, so really unpacking these ideas. And also you can talk a little bit before you jump into those prompts about what you all thought about, about authentic content and CRE instructional strategies and the lessons. Questions for you all. One more thing, sorry. There is an even number group and an odd number jam board, again, because of the numbers situation. And so if you are in an even, if you are in group two, four, six, eight, and so on, you're gonna go into the even numbered ones and find group two on this one. So group one is not gonna be used in this even number one. And then if you are an odd number, three, five, seven, and on, you're gonna go to the odd number one. Making sense? Questions for anyone? from anyone before we I set you off. Remember you have this document to refer to as you're going through if you wanna kind of rethink about the instructional strategies that we've talked about and really seeing them in the lesson plan. All right, I think we are about to set you off into breakout rooms. Carol, while we are waiting for others, I saw your chat about teacher prep and I, I spent some time in teacher prep, so I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a real challenge when they're seeing very traditional models in the classroom and then we're saying be inquiry based. Um, it's a real challenge. Uh, I think, you know, I'm a, I obviously this is what I spend my life doing, so I'm a little bit of a broken, you know, record on this, but I really believe that instructional materials can provide that model. And so please feel free to use those sample lessons that you were able to um, uh, go through to be able to do that. And then um, we often um, work with education, part, higher education like this, you, um, and so we're happy to help out on that side too, if, if it's helpful at all, um, can talk separately about that. But that's, you know, it really is, they need a model and there's the model that they're seeing is traditional. And so we need to be able to provide them with something different. Now it's really important they understand classroom management, all the things that their classroom set up, all the things classroom community that they can still get this really valuable, but it's challenging when they're seeing that very traditional model. Yes. Um, so I, I really think you gotta combat one model with the other. Yes, yes. I think the most powerful thing I can do for them when they're with me is engage them in inquiry. Yeah, I yeah. I love that part of my job. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a challenge. So I it's appreciate challenge. I appreciate the offer. Yeah, it's a challenge. I, um, I, I have it. a note for Carol too, if that's all right. Please do. I love right. it. So um, I don't come from a social studies background. This is actually my first year teaching, so or will be my first year teaching social studies, but I do come from a science background. Yes. And there's a, a science protocol, it's called MBI, uh, that's been around at maybe a little bit longer. I don't know, because like I said, I haven't been in social studies, but that might be where you find uh, video examples if you need those for the people that you're training. Because um, I, I understand that like creating your own inquiry-based units is really difficult especially like you're trying to tackle the question and really you should be tackling the end first and whatever else. So like that might Carol, be another place to start if you're struggling in the social studies arena. Carol, are you looking for examples of students um, taking part in inquiry um, at the elementary level uh, video? I, I am and I've looked at some, I um, have gone through through the inquiry ed resources. Of all Georgia students. Public Schools um, Department of Education website has a whole site where they went in and they filmed um, inquiry lessons being done um, with teachers and students. Could you say that and again, which public school it's, system? It's the Georgia Department of Education. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks all. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in. I love that. Love that. Love that. Thank um, you. So uh, we only have a few minutes left. I'm happy to stay on. We don't have another session after this, but I'm happy to stay on with folks um, who have further questions. Um, hopefully that was an opportunity to kind of see how these instructional practices come to life. I think what I hope you all walk away with is that sometimes when we use the words like culturally responsive education, it can feel like, whoa, that's a big thing. I know I don't know how do I how do I do that in kindergarten? How do I, what does that actually look like? And I hope by examining the instructional strategies, you can see that probably a lot of this you're doing, and a lot of this you could be incorporating into the work that you're doing across subject areas, and that there are practical ways to think about, you know, think of about think fair shares, thinking about opportunities for talk to learn, thinking about multiple stories and pr providing that in without one-to-one -one technology, um, and thinking about what that looks like. And so hopefully it was that opportunity to be able to see those lessons in, in play. Um, I do wanna spend a few minutes if there are any questions 
Um, I think I'm up to date on all the questions I answered Carol's or not really answered, but punted on Carol's question, um, saying it's hard um, in terms of teaching prep. If there are other questions, please feel free to take yourself off mute um, and share those. Um, if there are other questions that you'd like to put in the chat, please do, and I will stay on um, and talk with anyone that is interested in. As you are leaving, before you leave, I would love to do an exit ticket. Um, an exit ticket is a big part of inquiry-based learning in terms of thinking about that formative assessment. I'd love for you to just follow, listen uh, to um, respond to these prompts in the chat. I used to think, and really, uh, obviously, this is grounded in CRE. I used to think, and now I think. Um, so I used to think, and now I think. If you could respond to that chat, I would love. And then please feel free to take yourself off mute or to ask questions or put them in the chat, and I'll stick around and answer those. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your time. I used to think culture responsive teaching is more about race, culture, ethnicity. And I'm feeling Samantha's working on the, the now I think part, but I, I want to emphasize that it's not to say that it's not to do with any of those things, um, but it is when we're talking about authentic content and the relationships you have with your students and really thinking about historically marginalized students. And, but there's also, it's a yes and to really thinking about the learning experiences, that these are, it, it isn't an either or, that these are all part of culture responsive education um, and are really key components of it. And now I think it's about bringing all the different race, culture, and ethnicities together. Oh, the chat's going too fast for me. I used to think that the informed action needed to be taken using those diverse and unheard voices. I need to articulate that better for the, those I work with. I used to think I would not be able to find sources. Oh, sorry, I read two together. But now I think I'm using those diverse and unheard voices. I need to articulate that better for those I work with. Yeah, when you're thinking about that, also, I see one about outside audiences. Please go to that, um, uh, if you have time, to go to that informed action uh, inquiry challenge statement uh, session um, with Jeanette from our team. She'll really be giving some practical ideas of something that we've designed called the inquiry challenge statement that really helps your students think about who the audience is, what kind of action they want to take, what product they want to create, and it's something that can be used regardless of if you're using our curriculum or not. Um, and so it's a really great way to think about those components and making that action really be localized to your, what's authentic for your students and really having it come from them rather than from you. I used to think I knew most of the pedagogical knowledge of inquiry-based learning. Now I think I know only the tip of the iceberg. I, I will tell you that I feel that way every day. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I, I am right there with you on that side of things. <laughs> I used to think that inquiry was just for science and hands-on activities. Now that I think that inquiry goes beyond. Is inquiry is about asking questions what we can do about that in all subjects. Couldn't agree more. It is something that very much goes across and taking that scientific approach can really help students make that knowledge be sticky and have that deeper learning occurring. Any questions as you guys are finishing up those exit tickets? I have a, um, a comment. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. I think it's a it's a lot to to absorb, but highly wide opening experience. Um, I'm thinking about um, the possibility of having a Padlet or something so we can like throw in there um, as kindly Alicia and, and Tammy has shared links just to post things after these these wonderful experiences. Yeah, I will talk to our conference organizers, uh, Martin and Ashley, and see if we can get something going. We can post it possibly. I think I saw Martin pop on here. Um, and Martin's like, oh man, she, I'm here. So uh, no, just joking. I think that's a great idea. And I think we could maybe post something on the on the hub. Does that sound like something we could do, Martin? 
Yeah, actually, what what we'll do is we'll post something on the hub and we'll also send out, I'll be sending out an email tonight just with a thank you for everyone for attending um, the link to join the um, uh, the keynote tomorrow, which is also on your hub, uh, you know, just a reminder of to check out the hub. And then we'll see if we can come up with a quick Padlet or some other uh, collective strategy so that we can share all of the links and all the great resources people have been sharing all day long. So great idea. Thanks for sharing that. Any other questions, comments, anything else? Thank you, Samantha. That's a nice thing to hear. Appreciate that. Bales? Good stuff. Awesome. I'll hang on for one more minute, make sure there aren't any straggling questions. But thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for being engaged today. Thank you for dealing with the Zoom fatigue that we all feel and still being engaged here. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking on this a lot. Like you said, it's a fire hose of information. It's a lot. Appreciate you all taking it in.